Good afternoon and welcome to the NSF Career Perivius Awardees panel discussion. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. Here to moderate our discussion and introduce our panelists is Dr. Ravi Prakash. Dr. Ravi Prakash received the B.Tech degree in Computer Science and Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, in 1990, and the MS and PhD degrees in Computer and Information Science from The Ohio State University in 1991 and 1996, respectively. He joined the Computer Science Department at UT Dallas in July 1997 as an assistant professor, where he is now a professor. In 2014, he was appointed to the Collegium B Honors Program as an affiliated faculty member. During 1996-97, he was a visiting assistant professor in the Computer Science Department at the University of Rochester. He is a recipient of the prestigious NSF Career Award for his work in the area of mobile computing. He currently serves as the Speaker of the Academic Senate at UT Dallas. Dr. Prakash, welcome. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for that very kind introduction and uh, welcome to all of you uh, for this session. Uh, we have three wonderful panelists, three very recent Career Award winners, and it will be our pleasure to listen to them and uh, learn from their experience uh, preparing a successful proposal and I hope uh, all of you will find something useful in these so that as you go on to prepare your own career proposals and for that matter any other NSF proposal some of the suggestions that they have to offer will be of use to you. Now of course as Tiffany said my career award was in 2001, so by various standards, I'm a fossil in that regard. Uh, things have changed significantly. Uh, so the specific information that three of our colleagues here have to offer would be of great use to you. So it is my pleasure to actually tell you about the three colleagues we have here. We have Professor Chingu. We have Professor Valerio Ungo. Ungo and Professor Michael Kaldrubets, and all of them received their career award in 2020. So they are very recent winners. And let's start with Dr. Ching. So Dr. Ching, you are in the electrical and computer engineering department, and you came to us after your bachelor's from British Columbia and then your PhD at UC. Uh, San Diego, I believe, right? Yes. And you work in uh, a very interesting area that I cannot claim to understand from your bio, so nanophotonics, right? Uh, okay. So please tell us a little about your research and then maybe if you could uh, tell us about the topic of your career award winning proposal and how you went about preparing it. All right, uh, so I started here at uh, 2016 and my background is uh, making semiconductor nano lasers. So these are lasers with, you know, traditional um, all inorganic materials, um, but they but I make it very, very small, like nano a few hundreds of nanometer in size. That's what I did in my PhD. Uh, now I continue doing that, but after I came to UT Dallas, I started collaborating with a few colleagues that works with this material called Profsguide. So it's a relatively new material, uh, and we decided to make lasers out of it. And in this case, we weren't making nanoscale lasers, we're making actually bigger, slightly bigger microscale lasers. So that has been um, a shift in focus since I come here. So it took me um, a few years to you know get started and get results on that. So in terms of the career award, um, I actually the the award is actually on the the Prof's Guide to Micro Laser Program, and I actually did not apply for the career award in the la in the first two years 
just because I didn't want to apply in the direction that was too similar to my PhD research and I don't have enough results uh, in this newer direction that I was working on. Um, but nonetheless, eventually, um, in, I did get the career award on the Prof's Guide laser um, project. So I, I do want to elaborate it a little bit in the sense that this, I got the award um, during my second time of application. So the, the previous year, 2000, um, I guess the 2019 year, I also applied and the topic was Prof Sky Laser plus something else. So it's like basically two projects that are both related with the Prof Sky material, but one is laser, one is like a meta surface, meta material kind of project. And I did not uh, get the award that time. Um, so I can elaborate more on that, but I, I just do want to tell the history of uh, you know, how it evolved. Great. So, so you know, uh, there's some very interesting things to unpack from what you just said, right? One is that, uh, and this is especially for the new faculty here, right? Uh, we tend to see successes of people. We don't see that there were several attempts before that where perhaps uh, people were not successful. So just because you don't get your proposal funded the first time around doesn't mean that you should lose heart. And the other thing that uh, King you mentioned is that you didn't apply in the first two years because you wanted to maybe carve your own identity as a researcher before you apply. Is that am I hearing you correctly here? Right, right. Correct. So, so I mean, the, the risk is, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that the risk is panelists might look at your work where you haven't developed your own body of work separate from your advisor or your previous mentor and may say it's just a continuation, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are, you, are you forming your own research agenda that will propel you in the future? I guess that's what is very important. Is, is, would you like to maybe talk about that? Right, so this topic is certainly like nothing like what I did previously. I mean, of course, it's in a general area of making smart lasers. Um, so I would think um, the, the people that's on the panel reviewing the proposal are probably people who's never heard of my name, for example. But I did wait uh, a couple of years, like I mentioned, to get some publication out in this topic already. So um, in 2020, one of the comments, I guess it was commented as a, um, what's the word, uh, a, a con, a, a disadvantage is that she has done like a lot of the work that's proposed in the proposal already because she published that already. But uh, at the same time, I did also show that, you know, there's a clear track and success of this project. Thank you. So let's let's move on to we'll come back to you because I, we have lots of questions for you. We'd like to learn from you, but let's uh, move on to our next colleague, Dr. Michael Kuladrubitz. He is a professor of associate professor of physics and Michael came to us with a PhD from Princeton and then stints as postdoc at Boston and Berkeley. And he also got his career award in 2020 and uh, his area of research is in non Equal variety of non-equilibrium quantum mechanical systems. Michael, I don't understand any of that. So maybe you could tell us more about it and also tell us about how you went about preparing your career proposal. Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you for including me in this. It's certainly nice to be able to talk to people. And uh, as I said, when they asked me, I don't know if I have any useful advice, but I'm happy to you know tell my experience, uh, which I mean, so first off, my research I think it's a very accurate description. I do anything with the word non-equilibrium and or quantum involved, I'll get excited about. Uh, so quantum mechanics, as I think most people know, even if you don't know the math, is the fundamental description of most of the universe that we live in. A very well-established theory, but in terms of understanding what it means for practical experiments, for kind of next generation quantum devices, and you know, increasingly, if, if you want money in this field, for quantum computing. It's the big buzzword these days. Um, it's very complicated to understand how large scale properties emerge from these microscopic uh, quantum mechanical systems. So I've worked in a huge variety of non-equilibrium quantum systems throughout my career. 
And I would say that's very relevant to the, the career. So um, I got it this year, or 2020, uh, applied in 2019. Uh, I was actually, so I'm a theorist, and that was on my first go round, meaning I can't tell you all that much about the NSF reviewing experience, but uh, what I will say is I also had a similar experience as Ching, namely that I delayed uh, submitting. So um, I didn't submit in the first year based on everything I've heard. I absolutely would not have gotten it if I had submitted uh, for reasons I'll, I'll say in a second. Um, it was also like it was due on the day of my daughter's um, due date. So I figured that wasn't best recipe for success. But I did apply um, for the first go round about, I guess I would have been about a year and a half at UT Dallas at that point. Is that true? Yes, that's true. So, um, so about two years in, and what I learned, so the reason that I feel like I was competitive this go round, that I wouldn't have been competitive a year before, is from failing on a bunch of other proposals. So I submitted particularly the Air Force Young Investigator and got rejected pretty soundly, talked to the program manager or officer, and she gave me a very specific feedback that stuck with me, which is, so you're proposing to do what you did, roughly speaking, as a postdoc, as as grad student, um, you know, extensions to that, but in the same general field. And it's not that we don't think you can do it. It's that if you're proposing that, you're competing against your postdoc advisor and your PhD advisor and all these big shots in the field who are solving the very broad problem in non-equilibrium quantum physics. I mean, it's um, difficult to compete against those people until I have a number of publications and can really identify my expertise. So she made the very useful suggestion that I needed to find something that I would be known for. What is the area that I'm going to be the expert in? And so the career was the first time I wrote a grant that was really focused. Um, so there are two things I've worked on in the past, one is what's called flow case systems, which is you, you drive a system periodically and it basically it's a very useful tool for manufacturing new dynamics or new quantum systems. And the second thing is something known as cavity QED, which is um, a system where you have some degrees of freedom, atoms or spins or electrons, coupled to um, just basically like these laser cavities that Ching was just talking about. So some photon degrees of freedom but they're treated them quantum mechanically. Basically, it's, it's, it's one of the leading ways of getting particles of light to behave like particles instead of like just um, dry fields. And what my career proposal is on is essentially combining those two ideas. Uh, it's using some very nice mapping from the flow case system that I worked a lot on to these cavity QED systems and trying to kind of um, play them off each other get new physics out of one from the other and vice versa. It's not, there are not as many people working on it. We had some initial results that really aren't exactly on that, but could be interpreted as being on flow K plus cavity QED. And essentially, I think one of the things that I got feedback on from the, um, the referee reports was, it was a new enough area with enough, just a new enough direction with few enough competitors that um, there was reason to believe it would really lead to some new and interesting science. So the big thing that I learned from other uh, failures was you need to specialize a little bit. And I think the rule of thumb is if you're not at MIT or Harvard, you know, anywhere else basically, you need to find something that your students can do, that your postdocs can do that will set you apart. And that that definitely, I think, helped with the career proposal. Great. So, so I think uh, I I heard Michael you uh, echoing something that Ching had mentioned uh, in terms of uh, you have to have your own identities, what you would be known for, right? As opposed to what your mentors, your PhD advisor and postdoc mentors. So, some separation from them definitely helps. And the other thing that I heard was when you said, if you're not from Harvard or MIT, find something that you can do. Uh, the way I hear it is when you propose that you want to do something, the reviewer may agree that, yes, this needs to be done. But the next question is, can you convince them that you can do it? Right. Yeah. Do you have the credibility, the resources and the manpower 
and the equipment to do it, right? Uh, if it is just a great idea, but you cannot deliver it, then they will not give you the money. Is, is that? Yeah, I mean, and I think they're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. So it's not that they didn't believe that I could deliver these results on 12K. They believed that mm -hmm. my PhD advisor could deliver it mm -hmm. 20, you know, two times as fast because mm -hmm. it's just working with different resources. It's working in a field that he's already established in. So it's it's not so much distinguishing yourself because they don't believe you can do this science. Mm -hmm. It's distinguishing be yourself because you need to have something that's yours. It's your baby. Yeah. Something that you you grow from from a seed rather than from yes. an established plant. Yes. And um, I mean, again, I, I see it as two sides of the same coin. It's not that you necessarily have to specialize because otherwise you can't do the research. There are always open questions in the field. Mm -hmm. But if you don't convince them that yours would be open questions that matter, they're going to give the money to the person who um, has shown that already. True, true, true. So thank you. So so let's move to uh, Valerio. Valerio, you are in this panel. You are the most experienced, perhaps. Like you've been here at UTD the longest and you recently got your tenure. So congratulations on that. And uh, so you got uh, your uh, your specialization is in aerospace engineering from University of Pisa initially, and then you went to South Africa, right? University of Pretoria, got your PhD, and then at EPFL in Lausanne, uh, which is a very fine institution. I've spent multiple summers there as a visiting faculty, so I, I can attest to the fact that looking at Lake Lausanne while doing your research is a very conducive. <laughs> so, uh, tell us about your research and uh, your path because it was a bit different, right? You were not even sure whether you'd be eligible for it when you applied. That's correct. First of all, hi everyone and thank you so much for this kind of invitation. I'm super glad to share my experience. Of course, I'm not going to provide any suggestion to anyone, you know, take with congrams Salis what I'm going to say. This is my personal experience. It's just one sample in the billions of points you can find up there. So as you are saying, Ravi, um, you know, I didn't have the issue of my colleagues in distinguishing myself from my advisor because my advisor were so far away from NSF. And uh, so my main issue was that, you know, I didn't have, you know, I'm an experimentalist. My research is in experimental fluid mechanics in, uh, you know, the main focus is atmospheric turbulence and um, with application to wind energy. So doing experiments in this field, I needed to design and build my labs. So I work in the field. So in the field, we do measurements of the wind, the wind turbulence with the wind lidars, which are laser based instruments. And for this, you know, we build the mobile station that we call today UTD mobile wind lidar station. So it has several of these LIDARs, a lot of uh, IT infrastructure. And with this facility, we travel around the US and also outside of, of the country to do our experiments. So it took about more than a year, about two years really, to put together at least, you know, the beta version of what we have today. Of course, it looks very different today. And the other big project was the design and construction of the boundary layer wind tunnel. Maybe you have heard about this project is the blast wind tunnel that we have in the West Tech building is a 5.5 million project was funded by UT Dallas. And, you know, for me it was a great, you know, adventure because I remember I joined in August 2014. I remember the second week in September 2014, I had the meeting with the previous president, Dr. Daniel, the provost and the dean and the department had all together discussing this project. Me it was the new guy, you know, proposing how to implement this great project. And finally, it was great that, you know, in 2018, we were able to inaugurate this big facility. So for me, proposing a convincing uh, career proposal was mainly having the infrastructure and already, you know, nice preliminary data to share with the community and convince, as my colleagues already said, you know, convince the panel that you know what i was proposing was uh, of course you know well motivated with great scientific question but of course doable and implementable through the research project and uh, then my story was as you mentioned was kind of you know interesting because uh, i just submitted my career proposal in 2017 and uh, 
few weeks later, my submission, I got an award from the same program and there were clearly some overlap from my uh, between my career proposal and my unsolicited proposal. So then I decided to withdraw that proposal. And, uh, you know, that research that was about wind energy and atmospheric turbulence was already funded. Then for the next year it was already 2018. I decided to switch completely direction and move towards the uh, geoscience meteorological uh, program. And uh, I guess it was a bit too much challenge. That proposal so was not really well received. I mean, the review were not great. You know, they liked the idea, but was I should admit was a bit naive, that kind of proposal. Uh, because in a way, you know, I was trying to create, to put together a new idea that I'm currently working on, but, you know, was clearly a green proposal. So in 2019, I decided to go back to the program that finally funded my career, so CBAT Fluid Dynamics. And I guess the, the proposal was very similar to what was funded, just, you know, that I was so excited about my achievements, my new facility. I tried to stuff everything in that proposal, wind tunnel experiments, field experiments, and theory, and simul. So clearly, the reviewer were excited, but the main comment was there is too many things here. You know, it, it was, you know, then looking back, I think I should agree with the comments of the reviewers. So what I proposed then in 2020 was, you know, just trimming down and just getting the backbone, the best idea from the previous proposal. And instead from, uh, you know, putting together field and wind tunnel, this proposal is mainly focusing on doing field experiments of aerosol, aerosol transport in coastal region. So it means studying through our LIDARs the transport of any kind of particles. So mainly for the Gulf of Mexico, it might be uh, pollutants generated by oil spill in the water, that then this particle get trapped in the atmosphere and transported. So it's very important problem also for air quality or health, you know, health problem with people, for people with uh, uh, respiratory problems. So I try to, expand the proposal, you know, having a focus from the scientific question, but maybe expanding better the broader impacts. And then finally, you know, now you can see I, I was able to succeed with this proposal. So for me, it was merely a process of trimming down and, you know, polishing and maybe really getting better focus to the core idea of the proposal. You know, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting observation. You know, when we start out as young researchers, right, we have, even after having worked for many years as grad students and postdocs, we still have a very romantic notion of our research proposals and projects. And every one of our projects is going to revolutionize the field. And we put too many things into the proposal, right? And uh, when the reviewers look at it, of course, it can get overwhelming. And the other thing is if there's too much, nothing shines out, right? So if they really want to say, well, this is the real nice stuff about this proposal, it gets very hard, it gets so crowded. So in that sense, less is more perhaps, right? Um, that was exactly what I was saying. So right, people uh, yeah. say less is more. And uh, when you go to, you know, you try to reduce the amount of material that you put in your proposal, then you have the chance that you have space to go more in details in your task and what you are going to achieve. So you increase the credibility of your proposal and your project. Yeah, yeah. Because when you put too many ideas, then automatically you have no space to provide the right detail to show that you have the skills, the capabilities, and clear idea in detail what you are going to do quarter after quarter. And that's important, you know, as Michael was saying, you have to convince that that project is doable. It's not just a nice idea, but it's doable and it's going to be implemented with the resources that you have available. I mean, just to follow up on that, yeah. uh, when I submitted this Air Force proposal, the cavity QED stuff that became my career was one of the three aims. It became a full proposal and that's when I got it. <laughs> Right, I guess I can also echo on that in that uh, I mentioned I was rejected the first year um, and in, in that submission, I mentioned that I had two topics. One is the laser topic. Another one is a meta surface topic. Um, so I sort of know at the time already that um, it should be 
a one single topic. So I try my best to link these two topics into um, a single one. And the reason that I did that was because I didn't actually have enough results on the laser project. So I, I but I do have some nice results on this other meta service project that I wanted to, you know, chip in. But then um, um, the um, the feedback that I got was the laser project was definitely the more interesting one and the meta surface project is just there to be it's a bit distractive and they also questioned that the laser project is hard enough for, for one person in five years how do you fit another project in so yeah that that's I, I think I knew that um, going in but then I still tried um, the other way around which didn't succeed so, so I want to throw two questions up in in front of you, and maybe there one is uh, based on you know I have significant experience on the other side as a panelist, and I presume uh, the three of you don't have that level of experience reviewing proposals. But what I've seen happen in panels is that uh, there would be some panelists who would latch on to the weakest aspect of an otherwise good proposal and start attacking or criticizing that otherwise good proposal for its weaknesses. So even the good part gets kind of forgotten and that proposal moves from a highly competitive to a competitive category and misses out. So as, as Ching, you mentioned, right, if there is some other part which is weaker, that actually can take away from the parts of the proposal that are strong. Uh, both in terms of taking the spotlight away and as uh, Valeria you mentioned you don't have space to actually then describe more about what's good. So so for all three of you, um, what did you learn in this process in addition to what you already described, uh, the initial failures and the feedback you got and then you improved upon that? and 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 during this process, I'm pretty sure, as you said, some of you reached out to program officers. How did you reach out to them and how useful was the advice? And I'm pretty sure you also had mentors, right? You had mentors, including mentors in the current departments that you are, plus maybe your mentors who were your PhD advisors or your postdoc advisors or some other senior people. So how did you tap into these resources to improve your proposal? Anybody? Maybe Ching, you want to go first, perhaps? Um, sure. So there, there are many questions. <laughs> so um, let, let me <laughs> answer a few. Um, so I did not actually reach out to the program manager the first time before submission. Um, I did after I did talk to the program manager after the, the rejection the first year. So I did not wait for a full year um, to talk to her. So I actually talked to her like, you know, a month or so after the rejection. And she was pretty much telling me the, the same things that was in the uh, reviewer feedback, but she did emphasize on what the reviewers um, disliked the most and gave me good suggestions for next year. And then, um, um, so I actually, for both years of my submission, I started preparing really early. Um, so I pretty much got the proposal ready at the beginning of June um, in my first submission, and I started sending it out to different people to read, uh, different mentors, as you mentioned. And uh, so that I was able to get good feedback and I chose um, a range of people to read. Well, I mean, I only sent it to like three people, but one of them would be exactly in my technical field. Another one is in electrical engineering, but really doesn't know too much about my specific work because I wanted to get uh, feedback from people with different expertise because that's what a reviewer panel would be and they gave good suggestions. And another great resource is our UTD internal funded um, proposal list that the OSP share. So I was able to see you know, all the past winning career proposals and how they are different from the regular proposal and what similarities all this winning career proposals were. So I think that all together helped. So so the, you know, you said that 
uh, among the people you shared with, you sent it to one who was exactly in your area, so they could go deep into the technical depths and somebody else who was not in your area, but you could read as a generalist in electrical and computer engineering, which is very important because not every panelist will be an expert in your area, right? They are reviewing 15, 20, 25 proposals coming from different areas. So readability of your proposal to a researcher in your field, meaning not your subfield, but in your field of physics or wind energy or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, meaning that readability is very important too, right? Right. Actually, I think the most useful feedback that I got are from this more general readers. Um, because they they can see the bigger picture. Yeah, and, and and I think the other aspect is if you are an expert in the area and you are you're making some implicit assumptions in what you write that are obvious to others who are in your sub area, but not necessarily obvious to somebody who's outside your area, and they might see that as uh, ambiguity in the proposal because they are not able to connect or fill in those gaps. So Correct. I think as writers, we have to be very careful about that aspect too. Correct. Like one example is I did this experiment of testing a laser and then I was very proud of my uh, you know, lab setup that I built. So I included a fancy schematic of the setup um, and um, the, the person who's you know, not exactly in my field um, who read it, she said, well, you, you did you like you showed the measurement result already, so obviously you have the setup. Why do you need to show the setup again? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a a great feedback in that you know I was more attached to my setup than the readers. So yeah. yeah. So so Michael, um, when uh, you know King mentioned that she wrote her proposal well in advance. Uh, shared it with uh, other people. Uh, did you go about doing it the same way? Uh, yeah, I think for this one I was pretty far in advance, so I have to say um, I have two grants right now. This one I think I did about a month in advance or maybe a few weeks of circulation. The other one I wrote in literally a day and happened to get. Um, so I don't know that I have consistent advice on that one, but um, uh, yeah, so I, I did do this one pretty far in advance because it was again of all the projects, this is the one that you know, most pulls at my heartstrings. It's the one that I care most about, and so I really wanted to, to get the ideas out there and see if yeah. I could get feedback. Um, I have to be honest, the feedback I got from people was not all that useful. Um, I sent it to people mostly in my field, not actually that many external people, you know, PhD and postdoc advisors, and they gave a couple of comments, but nothing particularly notable. I talked to the program officer actually at a, a big uh, meeting. So there's a, a March meeting is big in condensed matter. I just they do like a I don't know, coffee with the program officer, a program manager type deal. So I, I talked to him and again it was. It was nice, but it wasn't really all that productive. What was incredibly productive is talking to people who had won careers in my department and very well funded people in my field in my department. So I have a senior colleague, Chan Wei Zhang, who was incredibly helpful. Multiple points as I've come on board here at UTD. Um, and he's very well funded, so he's able to help me see where the funding opportunities are, but also I think the more useful thing I've learned there that is very relevant to career is how to direct a proposal that will find the right niche within the field. So for example, I, I don't consider myself a quantum computing person, at least not historically, um, but he had a much better idea of the funding landscape and what people are looking at. And very useful discussions, you know, basically pointed me that these are directions that are getting funding, these are directions that people care about. Turn what you're already doing into something that's relevant to that area. So it's not that it really changed the science that I was proposing, at least not much, so much as where you emphasize the physics. Um, things like cavity QED, I don't really do a lot of work on quantum sensing, but that's really, really important in a lot of these, um, like NSF part of their big idea is quantum sensing and quantum information. So 
targeting that was very useful and that just useful discussions with people in your department. They'll be much more open to talking and. Yeah, just getting a broad sense from there. I have to say the other thing I was going to just go ahead and disagree with mm -hmm. because it's fun to disagree, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. So I'm a theorist and I think I'm the only theorist on this panel. Um, the one thing that I haven't seen much of is that a single weakness kills a theory proposal. Mm. Because the one big difference with a theory proposal, at least from the small experience I have, is that it's not quite as in line, right? Like Ching's very proud of her setup. My setup is there's a cluster that somebody else runs and I give my students access to it. Mm -hmm. And maybe like they get Mathematica access. Uh, so there's no broader setup. There's nothing to break. So in that sense, if I have an idea for some project I want to do or some particular uh, topics I want to address, if one of them doesn't work, there's less of a penalty for that. There's, okay. It's not yeah. obvious that it completely kills my research. So I at least a little bit of reviewing I did was for it was a person who was going to obviously get the grant. He was very good. It was just a renewal, but you know, of his proposal, maybe 20% was BS, and I think we all knew it. But there was enough in that 80% yeah. that it was clear that even if he didn't do those 20%, it, it didn't matter. And you know, maybe I'm wrong. He does the 20%. And I think in theory, you can get away with that a little bit more. Yeah. So actually, I've seen some really good proposals in theory, mm -hmm. particularly as a person gets more senior, that are a little bit more expansive. Yeah. And I don't think it kills you as much uh, as a theorist, as an experiment. As, but, but, as a, but, but when you're starting out new, right? And you when don't you're starting have out that new, you do have to focus, yeah. But well, for example, in mine, I proposed some numerical methods I wanted to try. I could have cut those because I would say probably a third of the experimental methods, I, uh, sorry, um, uh, computational methods I propose won't, won't end up working out okay. for various technical reasons. But proposing it as a potential and that's something our group has experience in to at least try, um, I think it helped rather than hurt, even if it, like some other places they might take that as a weakness and kill the proposal on those grounds. In theory, showing that you have the breadth to perhaps you know, address it from different angles if, if it doesn't work. I think can be helpful. Sure, great. So basically, meaning there is no definite formula for writing a successful proposal, right? Each yeah. of us has to decide for ourselves what to do. So Valerio, uh, meaning how long in advance, how far in advance did you write and how did you seek opinion? And the other question is, when we all write our proposals, uh, Ideally, we should all write our proposals one in advance and then return to them after a few weeks and reread them and realize how bad it was right before we inflict it on the uh, the panel. So tell, uh, share with us your experience. I cannot agree more than what you just said. So maybe I will start from uh, my submission. So previous submission was in 2019. So I haven't contacted the program manager because, as I mentioned, I already received uh, an award from the same program. So, you know, I the program manager already knew my the kind of research uh, you know I've been doing. So I didn't have really the need to communicate to him. So I just started. I started quite in advance. So the submission was in uh, August, uh, actually that time July 2019. So in September I was already writing notes. So just, you know, brainstorming and putting some ideas, some, you know, some one pagers, you know, draft and see if the idea could fly. So then in January, I started seriously writing pages of the proposals, you know, going deeper in the details. As I mentioned, you know, I made too many ideas for a proposal. At the same time, you know, I'm an experimentalist and uh, for that project, uh, for my actually my actual career, uh, we are planning an experiment at the Galveston Bay State Park where we can deploy one of our So I've been starting working on the logistic. So writing, you know, working on an agreement with the state park, receiving a letter showing their uh, uh, their commitment for the execution of the project that of course this letter has been attached to the proposal so showing that you know I've, I've been working already in the preparation of the experimental part so getting all the right letters you know on the side you know, all these things that you might need already to boost your proposal 
Plus, while I was working on the proposal, I've been, you know, I've been doing outreach activities and connecting, you know, my interest is mainly high school groups. So I've been working now for a while with the Wiley East High School. And during the spring, I was starting doing some pilot projects, you know, exploring some possible collaboration of outreach activities that could be uh, included in the proposal. And then we end up writing together with these instructors a nice plan for outreach activity with high school. And finally, you know, I receive a letter from the principal. So it takes time to build this kind of collaboration. So this kind of collaboration actually would suggest to start at least one year in advance and not just looking for letter, but really building something solid that was actually well received from the panel. So these things that the, you know, all the outreach, maybe we can talk later about broader imperative activities that, you know, should not be just proposed, but really grounded, you know, uh, really connected, you know, improved, and now you are going to assess these activities very important. So the first year, you know, I did really, you know, that was the main goal of my year. So I've been working hard on the proposal. You know, at the end, you know, the, reviewer, the reviews were good, you know, didn't get funded, but, you know, I was proud of my proposal and I think what I got was right. The funny story is that in 2019, then I got tenure. And I got already two submissions for the career award and one was withdrawn. So in theory, in my opinion, I was not eligible for a third submission because I was already tenured and already had three submissions in a way, even was was withdrawn. So then in uh, was, I think, June 2020, so maybe four weeks, six weeks before the the deadline for the submission. I was having a coffee with a colleague of mine, actually Dr. Meloni, who received the career award this year as well from the uh, chemistry department. And actually talking, he, we were talking about his submission of the career proposal. And then talking, he maybe he suggests me, Valerio, you should be eligible for another submission, I guess. So then the day after I just contacted off your sponsor research. I then confirmed that I was eligible, but luckily, you know, my proposal was already there. And as I mentioned, you know, my main work was really to trim me down and just actually reducing the material that was already in that proposal. So I quickly reached out again to renew this letter again. I was, I mean, I'm still collaborating with the high school from Wally, with the state park. So I had everything ready. So actually I enjoyed this, you know, I didn't, did, you know, really my, my best, but you know, in that six weeks, you know, I really, you know, focused on that. It was just cleaning and trimming and making everything great, I guess. And my best support that I see for that proposal is uh, the review from an independent reviewer proposed by the Office of Sponsor Research. She gave me absolutely outstanding comments how to increase readability of the proposal where things may be maybe more streamlined, where was maybe a need for more clarification. And that was really a great feedback. And I almost agree, you know, all the time on the comments provided because what she was saying was true. And, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, the reading was kind of too technical. And maybe, as you mentioned, you know, not all the panelists might be really expert in your field, so you need to send the message without making the reading, I guess, too boring or too too detailed in a way. And, um, you know, I didn't, in, I mean, I, I never shared, to be honest, the proposal to mentors or uh, colleagues, because what I care the most is really, you know, comments for, you know, I'm very proud of my idea. So what I really need are really more comments from expert in writing and you know increasing the readability of the proposal. Sure. Uh, and that's what I received from the office sponsor research. It was great. Yeah. So 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 actually maybe we can change. Um, uh, Michael, do you have anything to say before? I just one other thing that I, I realized I didn't mention. So the one other piece of um, help that I received. Uh, NSF actually in my division sponsored a two day workshop at NSF headquarters, which I think was free for faculty. I don't really remember, but my department would have paid anyways. Um, 
where they brought in a number of people, the young professors across the country to learn about NSF. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be useful to see how NSF thought of itself and how they differ from some of the other agencies. So we learned a lot about the big ideas. Again, not everything was really all that specifically useful. So we did like a mock panel, which was fun, but it wasn't necessarily all that useful. But just seeing where NSF fits into the picture, I mean, at least for me, I didn't know much about funding coming to the university. That was really useful, and I think a lot of programs do that. Thank you. Yes. So, so let's change gears now and talk about broader impact and you know things like that. And maybe Ching, I'll uh, I'll go with you first. You know, in other proposals, right? Maybe it may not be that important, but here NSF is looking for your career graph, right? And a very big component of that is education education for grad students, for undergrads, and maybe as Valerio indicated, even outreach to uh, high school and other broader impact. So if you can share with us your uh, opinion and your thoughts on this. Right, so I mean, I definitely agree. Um, broad impact or outreach is a huge component of Korea. Um, and I think even though undergrad and graduate student mentoring, reaching out to you know, underrepresented groups, doing this one day summer camps, these are indeed part of the education program, but everyone does that, right? Like everyone put that, at least everyone puts those kind of things into their um, outreach section. So even though it's good to mention those, I, I think those are just wasted basically. So one really, I feel like one really need to have something special um, and one needs to prepare way ahead of time. So for me, I, I have been involved in this year long mentoring program with um, high school girls that actually uh, is what a UTD program um, organized by the, the provost office. But basically we have this team of like five high school kids from low income families and there's a high school teacher mentor, a graduate student mentor who's my student, a faculty mentor that's myself and we do this thing uh, slowly over a year and do a poster competition etc. So I've, I've been doing this for like three years by the time of my submission and for this pro program we actually like design a um, a name for each team and we get a t-shirt like like a matching t-shirt that everyone wears and we pose in front of the poster and the demonstration in the final presentation so i included a picture of that in my um, first draft and as you guys all know in writing proposals we're always struggling to um like we're always having more than 15 pages in the end, right? So the big struggle is where to cut down. So I thought, well, I've, I've, you know, I've spent enough time talking about this outreach program. I don't need to include a huge picture of just six people. And one of the feedback that I got was that, oh, definitely include this picture because, you know, a matching T-shirt and uh, actual experimental demo that speaks more than a paragraph of writing. So I, I guess, um, one of the things I want you to say is, is that do something that set yourself apart. I, I think this matching t-shirt example is something that a lot of outreach programs don't have. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, another, um, another item that I did include in my broad impact program is to talk about the experience that I had as a Optical Society of America representative to talk to the Congress and like a couple years ago. So even though that doesn't directly include outreaching, um, but it is related to outreaching for the country, right? Like in general. And because this is a fairly unique experience that most people don't have, I also included that into the outreach program. So anyway, so in summary, uh, I think the, the main point is to to set yourself apart with something special. 
So, so basically, meaning just boilerplate that I will have so many PhD students and so many grads and undergraduate students working. This boilerplate material does not work because everybody has it, right? So, how are you going to? Uh, and of course, at the same time, you want to be true to yourself. You really want to do what you are saying in that aspect as well, right? This is not just resume building or just doing something that you don't really believe in with the hope that it will improve because ultimately we want to be true to ourselves as researchers, right? Right, right. Yeah, so definitely I think including the, the stuff that everyone does won't hurt you. It probably won't help you either. Yeah. But something that you've truly done and which you think will definitely help society and will help propel your research into, you know, a greater visibility and use would definitely be uh, looked at very favorably. So um, now, now the other thing is, uh, whether you did mention about uh, interaction with Wiley East High School over one year and things of that sort and having uh, all the preparation for the field experiments in place over a year, right? Those of you who are doing human subjects experiments similarly need to lay the groundwork for all that before you write in your proposal that we, you will do human subject experiments because it can be very cumbersome and it can be very challenging so how do you prepare for it um, should be there uh, michael what's your opinion on the broader impact part of your proposal no i mean i completely agree with that it's it's it needs to stand out in a way that it doesn't in a regular nsf proposal as far as I can tell. Um, so for me, I actually had a very specific thing that um, had not been tested beforehand, but uh, God, it's, I don't know. Um, we are in the process of designing a little virtual reality simulator for quantum systems. So actually, it's a collaboration with a former UTD uh, professor who's now elsewhere, but um, it's something I've been passionate about for years is just quantum mechanics, understanding how they behave and understanding how playing around with quantum systems in a way that we can't do in reality is something that's always interested me. And so the outreach portion or the education proportion, I should say, um, is on designing this tool. So again, I picked something I cared about. I completely agree about that. You have to find the thing that you're passionate about, but probably not going to spend as much time on as the research. Um, and you do need some sense that it's actually not BS. So I will say the, the most data that I took for my career proposal was um, I wrote a little script to generate uh, images of a quantum hydrogen atom and like interactions with a little flashlight tool to measure it. I spent more time doing that than I did on writing like a little small initial scripts to get initial data on other parts of the proposal. Um, and I think again, that picture was worth a thousand words, showing that I had a little demo where I could, you know, measurement collapse the hydrogen atom and have it decay back to its ground state. But the people believed that I would actually do a VR simulator of this much more so than my initial data on time crystals or whatever. Right. So sincerity and, and credibility is very important, right? Both of them have to be there. Um, Valeria, you want to talk about your, you already did mention, but I want to hear more from you about your broader impact on education outreach. Sure, uh, maybe, I mean, I agree with the comments provided by my colleagues. Something I would like to add that I saw also coming up in my first review of my career proposal is assessment of the uh, outreach activities. So proposing, showing great ideas, great implementation, but must be something possibly outside of the lab, outside of the organization assessing this activity. And this should be, I think that this should be included either for the preliminary results, what has been done in the past, and what is going to be executed during the career project. Yes. So in my specific case, as I mentioned, uh, I have collaboration with Wiley East High School, and these activities are then evaluated by a board of the Wiley East High School. It's not something related to me. So we are executing the project, and then there is a group of instructors evaluating the project, so me, the instructor from Wiley East involved in the project and activities. So every year we are receiving a report 
highlighting the, the assessing the project that has been executed. Another part of the uh, my outreach activity is what we call the aero solidarity camp. So we use the LIDAR to do aerosol and wind measurements in the field. And typically we do this in collaboration with the Office of Sponsor Research. In the past, we have done this with the uh, CEEC Center, so the Center for Engineering and Science for Outreach Activities. So typically this is done in the summer, uh, hosting uh, uh, students typically from high school, from underrepresented groups, from the DFW area. So we host the student on campus for two, three days. And part of this activity is performing measurements with our LIDAR. Again, the assessment is done by the Office of Sponsor Research. We have statistics about participants, ethnicity, age, and also we track their path till the college. So we see how many of the students maybe change their path and maybe they enroll in uh, in college or they really come to UTD. So really providing data that can assess the activity. So we show that we already had the infrastructure. Another activity we have, um, we develop and uh, we are still developing uh, um, a demo for uh, exhibits in museum and public libraries. We have done this in the past, for instance, the Perion Museum. And after this exhibit, we receive a report from the Perot Museum providing again the, the number of participants, how many people provide the feedback, list of the feedback provided. So everything should be nicely assessed. I guess that is really a plus for when we propose outreach activities. So, so basically what I'm hearing from all three of you is that this is not just some throwaway portion of your proposal, but it, treat this almost as another scientific part of your project. You have a hypothesis, what you're going to do experimentally or theoretically and an assessment component, then you will have credibility in this as, this part of your proposal as well. And Complete. that will help. Completely agree, but of course we have, I mean, the challenge also to show the synergy with the scientific yeah. part. So, I mean, should be independent in in terms of tasks, but also we have to show the educational part yes. and the uh, uh, research part are, uh, you know, there is a synergy and coupling between these. And maybe something I hope we will have the chance to discuss is, and again, for me, maybe what, I mean, what I learned really the most is looking at, as Michael said, at previous successful proposals. So I, I will come to you, uh, Valerio, I will come to you in a little bit, but first I want to go to Ching first, because I know she has to leave at two o'clock and we have about two to three minutes. Uh, so uh, first of all, Ching, thank you so much for uh, giving your time to us. And uh, before we let you go, uh, I would like to hear any parting suggestions and thoughts from you before you, know, you, you sign off. Um, yeah, well, I, I see that there is a, a question or discussion about being a panelist mm -hmm. and, and maybe for some of not necessarily uh, related with a, the career proposal on how to get involved to being a panelist. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I want to uh, give a few comments on that. Yeah. Um, because I did, I had been an ad hoc um, panelist or like review one single proposal for a couple of times yeah. over the last few years. And then I did my first full panel review um, this February, which is a very different experience than doing being an ad hoc committee. Yeah. So well, to get involved, I think one, you, you can start with just being ad hoc um, committee members. But during the panel review, what I noticed, and as I've already heard, is that there are so many proposals to, to review. So the, the panelists don't actually spend as much time as you think to read your proposal, and they're not really in your field. Like most of the panelists are not in your field. They do make sure that you know, there's at least one person that's in the field, but I think really focus more on the bigger picture and the overall message. And I think this is especially true for the career proposal where they, in, uh, where all the panelists are more senior people who of course have seen a lot more work than us junior professors, but 
they they again they are it's unlikely they're exactly in your field because if they were they're probably your phd advisor that i'm not allowed to review your proposal anyway so so meaning for each one of us and especially in an early stage of our career right every proposal is a labor of love right and we want the reviewers to hang on to every word that we write <laughs> and every observation we make but and in, a, in an ideal world that would happen but in the real world yes uh, different people have different priorities and reading my proposal or your proposal is not their top priority even though they've made a commitment to do so and right. that I, yeah I, I do have one final comment which i don't know if it's um is advantageous but I'll, I'll say it anyway so for my career proposal i actually um, made sure that my spacing between lines is, is not one, it's actually 1.15, something like that. <laughs> so I actually, I could have had my entire proposal in, or in other words, I could have crammed one more page into my proposal if I made line spacing to be one, but um, I was giving advice that, you know, because it's the more senior people reading your proposal and they don't like to see very crowded proposal and they're reading so many. So I, I made sure that I do have larger line spacing. I don't know whether it actually helped or not, but that's what I did. I, I think I think the, the uh, meaning, of course, I'm one of those that reads on a large screen in a PDF document, so I can, I can deal with it. But I think the more important takeaway there is that just cramming detail and losing clarity does not help, right? right. Uh, it's the clarity of presentation, the clarity of thought, and uh, the trajectory of your idea, right? How you will do this is important. If they lose that, because if they don't have time to read every little word, but if the, the trajectory of your idea, your development is, is there, they will get it and they'll appreciate it. So. Right. Yeah, so that, that, that's very good advice. Uh, I know you have to leave, so uh, thank you so much for your time. And, thank you for uh, having me. Yeah, and much success in the future, uh, you know, with more proposals. And uh, I'm pretty sure Office of Research will be glad to help you and all other colleagues uh, get to greater successes. So thank you. And uh, so you can sign off now and we will continue our discussion with Michael and Valerio. Uh, and uh, thank you. Right. Yeah, and um, please don't hesitate to contact me with any additional questions. Sure. Okay, bye-bye. All right. So, um, Michael, in terms of uh, the, the aspect that you, you said you talked to your colleagues in the department, right? And mentorship, from what I heard from you, is important uh, for young researchers. Absolutely. Uh, and now that you are in a position where you are a career awardee, right? So you are somewhat of a, you could somewhat be, be a mentor to the newer faculty members. As a mentor, what would you do? So that, you know, meaning based on what the mentorship you got, so that they ha they get better suggestions and advice on how to succeed. It's a very good question. I don't know. I suppose I would push my department to hire young enough faculty that I have someone <laughs> to mentor first, but then, uh, once that happens, um, a lot of the things that were brought up today is I think the advice I'd give, um, start thinking about what your focus is, where you want to be the expert. The thing that I've heard said, not just about the career, but about tenure is what letters will be written about you? Your external people, what are they going to say you're the expert in? And start there. Find that focus, find how to tell a new story with what you already know how to do. Um, and then just, yeah, start working early. Career, I think, does tend to lend itself to a longer writing process and you have to really flesh out a, a plan. Don't immediately apply unless you really, really think you have a solid idea on it because I, I have not seen that applying in your first year is really all that useful for career. It's not a bad idea to defer a little bit. And I mean, like with anything, just identify where your field's going, identify where the trends are, make sure that you couch your research in the right language um, to, to hit but, but areas yeah. that people care about. 
But of course, meaning you're not saying that go running after the latest trend, right? You still, still have to be true no, to yourself, I right? I would say that's that's actually a very good point. So don't do that. It's a, a slight restatement of what I said earlier about you won't be able to compete with your advisors. You won't be able to compete in the latest trends. So like in my field, 2D materials are all the rave right now. I've heard tell that if you go to a conference by the end of that conference one week later, back when we go to conferences, there would be like 10 new papers in the field from that conference itself. So you simply, at least I don't have the personnel to do that. And um, it, it's realistically not where you're going to be able to jump into as a young faculty as opposed to an established person with an army of postdocs. So you can't jump on the trends. You can take what you're already doing that is not quite as trendy and make it clear that if that succeeds, it can contribute to the broader direction the trend signifies. Yeah, but somebody said, right, that if you see the bandwagon and you want to jump on, it's already too late to do so, right? Yeah. So, OK, so so um, th that's that's great advice. Uh, Valerio, uh, a question for you, um, slightly different is that um, you are one who does a lot of experimental work, right? So there is a significant need for resources, uh, both in terms of manpower and equipment, right? And money, of course. Uh, so, and and what I'm hearing is the first year, maybe not necessarily a good idea. But the question is, as you are building that body of research on which you will, the foundation on which you will rest your career proposal, the question from one of the attendees is, well then, if how do you get that money and the resource to do that? Uh, does UTD provide sufficient startup funds and facilities and support to do so? And so if the answer is yes, what's the nature of it? And if the answer is no, how do you do it? Yeah, I guess, you know, you know, we grow in the, you know, in exploring uh, Funding opportunities will uh, will grow in uh, learning how to write better proposal and uh, building our network. You know, are things that you know they again you don't build all this in one day. You know, you need to work hard for many years and build all funding pipeline. And you know, one day you will get what you really need. You know, at my time there was not as many opportunities as today. I've been. Uh, uh, working with Office of Sponsor Research, now we have the SPIRI program. We have, uh, you know, we have some um, funding mechanism for internal funding at UTD that are nicely uh, provided by the VP of Research, Dr. Pancrasio, and uh, the Office of Sponsor Research. And I'm sure there are other activities for promoting collaboration in the, within the university in senior with young faculty. So there are some, I guess the Office of Sponsor Research will be able to provide more details about this, that opportunity, I guess they exist for two, three years now. Beside that, you, you know, I was um, nicely supported through my startup package, you know, to start my research, definitely. I mentioned also some number about infrastructure, the UTD wind tunnel. And of course, at the beginning, you know, I was starting having some uh, uh, small contrast, small collaboration with the national labs, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, you know, small grants, small one year, like eager projects, let's say, to start doing things together. Uh, I am copy I of uh, one IUCRC with NSF, WinStar, that's another mechanism to building industrial collaboration and getting more funding for an experiment. Until you know the second year, second year and a half, I got my first NSF award. Uh, then I had another uh, award from the uh, Go the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So you know you start building gradually your funding pipeline, and then things getting better and better. You produce more research, and then you get your career. So I mean. It's a natural process, you know, you get small funding, you work hard, you deliver, you grow, and then you write better proposal, and then that's the way we grow. Sure. Michael, you, you are more theoretically inclined, so how? Uh, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I guess the nice thing uh, is that theorists, we, have, we, can, we can live on less, 
So you can go through leaner periods and tough it out a little bit better. But you still uh, need PhD students, right? Grad students to work with you to help. Yeah, I mean, so again, I, I I had a reasonable amount of startup actually still do. Um, at have is, that has not been the biggest issue, I would say, uh, with with getting things working. So at least in physics, we have lots of TAs available. Mm -hmm. I put a lot of my students on TAs um, just to keep them going. No, I would say the reality is, at least in my field, in my department, money hasn't been the biggest issue for getting the group started. The biggest issue is recruiting well and finding the right grad students and finding the right projects. I know certainly in my first year, the first two projects I gave my students didn't become papers and the next two did. Mm -hmm. And I think that general trend is, is something that I've learned. Um, so, so, so he has a lot of computational resources. So yeah, one big yeah, thing yeah. for us is that um, that has been basically free with my startup and just university wide computational resources. We've been able to tap into those quite well. Okay. So, so you if you if you're going to you uh, hire students and have them as TAs, do the selection very wisely, right? Meaning you have to make sure that it's not just for teaching assistantship, but how this student will be an integral part of your research as it grows and, and leads to a proposal, right? I suspect that's true. I have to say that every day <laughs> I kind of waffle on this and ask me in three more years and maybe I'll have better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to figure it out. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So, you know, the other aspect is that, of course, uh, you got your career proposal. And now what? How are you going to take it to fruition? And do you think everything that you wrote in your proposal, you will be able to finish? How do you plan for the next several years as you are carrying out the work? Yeah, so I guess I, I could start. Um, I mean, I, I, I almost guarantee not every single thing I wrote in my proposal is going to happen, but I also guarantee some things that I didn't write in my proposal will. Mm -hmm. So, um, Again, because I'm a theorist, I have a little bit more flexibility. It, um, the general vision is something that we've been very aggressively pushing, actually even before I got the career, but certainly since. What the career allows me to do is to dedicate a student or two and have them focus on that project. Okay. It also provides some incentive when undergrads come searching for research to have them be on these projects versus some of the other unfunded projects and that can of course you know tie into um, outreach and education as well so in that sense i'd say um, you just kind of keep doing what you were doing but with a little bit more focus okay. say before i got the career i was already very excited about this now i have a dedicated student on it and it is very clear that this is the direction that we will push as more and more personnel come on. Yeah. Valerio, how about you? I mean, that's the fun part. I would not call this as a problem. <laughs> so once you get funded, you know, you have the great opportunity to implement and start working on your ideas. You know, as I mentioned, you know, for me as an experimentalist, this has not been really an exciting year due to all the pandemic and the restriction we currently have. But you know, gradually we are starting setting up our experiments and we are starting taking preliminary data. And of course, it's a great opportunity for us to work on our preliminary data that we collect in the past to build up, you know, the results that we put in the proposal. And I mean, I don't see this, you know, I guess, you know, when we write the proposal, we already envision the path, the research path. So actually, it's just exciting having the resources to implement the project. As Michael just mentioned, you know, uh, I guess there is maybe more the opportunity to do more rather than, you know, maybe to don't implement what we already put in the proposal. And many times, you know, when we start working on a project that got funded, we are already out of time, you know, we have already things cranked in the lab and, you know, we are already moving forward. So I would say that that's really the fun part of getting funded doing research. Now, uh, in my experience uh, in the 
proposals that have been funded. Of course, uh, the the thing, the difference between an NSF proposal versus say a DARPA grant or something like that, is there's a there's a grant versus a contract, right? So in a DARPA contract, you have to deliver exactly what you promised. Uh, scientific research is a little less deterministic in that sense, right? So as you start working on your proposal, uh, you come across results and insights that take you in a slightly different direction than what you had because you have to be very nimble and you know and flexible in that regard, correct? So do you think that you will end up exploring other areas, maybe sometimes at the expense of something that you mentioned in your proposal? Uh, because that is scientifically more challenging and more relevant to the to the actual solution of the problem. I guess in that case, communication with the program manager is maybe the something to leverage. So you know, we show you know we done a report on our grants. We report you know our results and how we advance the project. And that's the chance also to expand and show new opportunities for the project. And of course, the program manager is going to read the, uh, your report and provide the feedback and agree and actually maybe support you in uh, your decision and you know working together on how to expand your research plan. So that's actually one of the great, you know, I'm very glad of the program manager that is supporting my research because you know we have great communication and every year really we have great feedback and support exactly in this kind of discussion how to pursue what has been discussed in the proposal and uh, expand to new opportunities that are just out there because you know we don't know where we will be in two years from now that is you know from the date we wrote the proposal uh, how about you michael i'm not sure if i have anything to add to that okay so, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but meaning, uh, you know, of course, now that you have your grant, so you have to, you're required to submit annual reports, right? And uh, you could also potentially, if if something very interesting, but not entirely relevant, but maybe an overlap, there could be avenues for requesting supplemental funds, right? That you could ask for. And I presume now that you have your career award, uh, you could ask for supplements for um, undergraduate researchers. Yeah. Right? On top of that, which could actually make your money go farther. Yeah. So yeah. I think one of the things that I'm certainly thinking to tap into soon is RU funding. Yes. Uh, they, um, you can apply for a supplemental RU funding. In principle, you are not supposed to need it, but you can request it at yeah. some level. And so I think the outreach there, at least for me, is where a lot of that will go. So a lot of my research is very hard for undergrads to do just because it requires a lot of background in quantum mechanics. It's very difficult to get them queued up on that. But an REU student who knows just the basics can get, can help basically create this VR platform. And in fact, I have an undergrad already basically doing that on just a research credit, but if one is interested over the summer, I think that's one one really useful resource to tap into. Um, so far, my program manager hasn't been so communicative, I would say. I think it's the impression I had from the meeting I had with actually a slightly different program manager before that they switched people, but um, was they kind of expect you to have a little bit of freedom here. You know, you have to push the overall direction in the right way and you know, you can't just go off and all of a sudden start studying botany or something. But as long as you're pushing in the right direction, NSF isn't so interested that it be exactly what you wrote. They just want good science to come out. And so in that sense, I'd say I kind of feel empowered to do that as the ideas come up. But so far, honestly, we're we're hitting exactly kind of what we said we were going to do because that's those were the ideas and now we just need to do them. Well, how about you? Are you seeking maybe a supplemental funds for REUs and a research experience for undergrads? For those of you who don't know what REU is, I can share the, my experience with my previous, I mean, actually, my current uh, unsolicited uh, project with NSF. And uh, yes, I requested REU supplement funding, so to execute research for undergrads uh, related to the project. So 
In uh, 2018, I had the five undergrad students working on the project. Uh, unfortunately, last year, due to the COVID pandemic, I had just one student working remotely. Hopefully, this summer we will have to, the chance to get more students on board, maybe five, maybe doing some hybrid uh, uh, projects. So, yes, SARU is a great support from NSF. Another uh, kind of supplement I would like to remember is also the intern supplemental funding, which enables collaboration with the industry. And uh, so NSF is going uh, to support uh, from six months to one year of an internship for uh, grad students with a company that maybe is already involved in the project. That has been a great experience because this is really a transition. It's something that they recommend to do not too close to graduation, maybe one to two years close to graduation. And I had already two students doing interns with NSF and that has been a great experience because really boosted the graduation and uh, launched the students towards you know the new working experience wonderful so so you know we are getting to the home stretch of this discussion it's been a very interesting discussion for me i have really enjoyed talking to the three of you and you know thank you for your time uh, before we conclude i think we should touch upon the mechanics, the timeline. So you said that you started working well in advance and you had the proposal submitted, but share with our participants who are new to this process. So you submitted your proposal by the deadline. From then until the funding actually happening, what happens? Meaning in both your experiences, how long did it take for you to learn the outcome, including the unsuccessful previous attempt. And, and this time when you finally heard that your proposal was funded, so how many months elapsed? And then from then on, what were the additional steps that had to be done until say the money was released by NSF to university and then the university said, now a cost center has been created and you can start spending the money. So step us through that timeline. So I'd be happy to start um, yeah. because I assumed I hadn't gotten a career mm -hmm. on the grounds of timing. I submitted it in whatever, it's mid-July, and I think I heard about it in early May, mm -hmm. early to mid-May of the next year. About so 10, 10 months. Yes. And some of that can be blamed on the pandemic, but not very much. Um, and so the way it works is they email you, they don't say you've gotten it, they say, You've been recommended for it. We're not promising blah, 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 but send us this stuff and maybe it'll work. And then you're asked to send both a technical and a non-technical abstract as well as some other forms. And I have to say after that point, it was very quick and very smooth. Uh, the one thing I've heard is that sometimes it can take a very long time after they put out the offer um, or the you know tentative acceptance. I put in the paperwork basically as quickly as I possibly could, maybe a day or two after I got it. And I heard about it mid-May and I got summer salary in June. Okay, wow, that's, that's pretty quick. That's it's quick. incredibly quick and I have yeah. no idea why after 10 months to review. So I think what I've heard and based on the people I've heard it from submitting, um, Paperwork very quickly can help the process along and the people who complain that it takes a long time. It's not that they're not submitting the paperwork, but maybe they're just a little slower than the ones who submitted it right away. Yeah, so my first proposal that was rejected uh, was a pain because, you know, from January I was checking on the website almost every week. I was checking, you know, new career award get announced. And finally, I guess in May, I got my final rejection and the review posted uh, on Fastlane. For this time that I was awarded, so I submitted at the end of July. I guess the panel was around September. I received the magic email uh, mid-October asking just for uh, uh, an abstract for public release. So in November was announced, January 1st, my cost center was already active at UTD, so that was super fast for me. Okay, great. So finally, I would say three months, four months from submission to okay. yeah. award. So I guess yeah. So so you mean there there is yeah 
Good. It can vary a lot. It depends really on the panel, on the program. True. Yeah, and, and and sometimes yes, you get your uh, acceptance or uh, rejection notification very quickly, and sometimes you could be just on the bubble, right? And the program officer is trying to figure out can he or she get money to fund your proposal, right? There's one more proposal, and there are negotiations inside NSF going on. You know, two programs might decide to together fund a proposal which has overlapped with both areas because the proposal is very good, but there isn't enough money in a single one to fund that. So those things happen. Have you had the experience in maybe the two minutes that left? Have you had the experience where your program manager came back and said, look, I can fund your proposal, but you have to reduce your budget. You asked for 500,000 we can only fund at 400,000, so cut something and revise your abstract and deliverables. Not, not to me. I okay. all my NSF project have been funded with um, the pro, the propo, the the budget proposed. Okay, Michael, have you? Uh, no, though actually I submitted to one program and NSF chose to transfer it to a different. Okay. Program. So they 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 will make that decision, not you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had the situation where, and I know several colleagues where they they budgeted for a certain amount, and NSF came back and said, "Well, the proposal is competitive, we'll fund it, but uh, you have to reduce the budget by a certain amount and correspondingly reduce the scope of your project. So then you have to revise your abstract and do so." As young researchers, you might be tempted to say, well, just give me the money. I'll do all of that work in the less amount of money. That's not a good idea. In that case, why did you ask for more money in the in the first place, right? So uh, that's your opportunity to seriously think about and say, well, if I am going to cut some from the budget, what is in the scope of the project that can actually will have to be removed, you know, cannot be done. So think through that. That is a possibility, at least in some divisions. So uh, we are near the end. It's 2.27. It's, it's, it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun. You know, it is, it's been my pleasure talking to the three of you. It's been a blast. And I, I don't think I had a chance to talk to three of my young colleagues uh, in the past, but this has been a delight for me. And I hope uh, I didn't bore you or bug you. And I'm pretty sure what cool. you what you shared is going to be very useful to our even newer and younger colleagues who are looking to write and submit very competitive and successful hopefully successful proposals so uh, you have my thanks and uh, on behalf of the office of research uh, i extend their thanks to you as well if in closing if you'd like to add anything uh, please my Really, what I learned the most in the preparation of my career is looking and reading uh, previous successful proposal. There is a structure underneath all this great proposal. They have something in common. Really highlight your main task and ideas in the first page. A crucial graphs about your career path. How to distinguish, you know, this research part from the outreach activity in the last three pages. There are there is something to learn over there, so I re strongly recommend to have access to the previous proposal uh, from the Office of Sponsor Research. That's really super valuable resource to learn how to write a great proposal. I strongly recommend it. And thank you so much again for the community. It was great to be here today. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Michael? Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I don't have much to add on the career. Uh, just to say, I mean, if you look at this in the broader context of young investigator grants, something that I was told by a funding agent for ONR, I think it was, is use this opportunity while you have it because it'll expire before you realize. And particularly outside of NSF, this is one of the few opportunities you ever have to force a program officer to look at your proposal. Once you get beyond uh, young investigator eligibility, they will just shelve your proposal on their desk and never look at it unless you have a relationship with them. So it's one opportunity to get to know a program officer that you simply won't have yeah. again. Um, but besides that, yeah, um, thank you everyone. I hope it was useful and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to talk today. Yes, thank you everybody. and. Uh, 
if you've uh, been following in the chat that they've been posting on the spire initiative from the office of research so uh, if you're looking for supplemental funding the utd office of research has multiple resources and uh, of course uh, the people in the office of research are very helpful in terms of uh, helping you through the process if you are new to this process on getting onto fastlane and research.gov and creating your profile all the way up to helping reading through the proposal preparing your budget getting the cert form properly routed all these things uh, are not necessarily the most exciting things for us as pis but they are necessary to be done so uh, all that resource is available. Office of Research also has research computing facilities that I guess Michael referred to and OIT also participates in that. So uh, if you need those kinds of computing resources, they are also available if you're starting in and you don't have the resources, independent computing resources. Um, and there are other such uh, facilities that, that I don't know, but I'm pretty sure your mentors do know of in terms of life sciences and neuroscience and other areas where there would be equipment that would be available to you. So please make use of those and please do not be shy in terms of asking for help. Um, your senior colleagues would be delighted to help you because your success reflects positively on the department too, right? So please don't be shy and uh, we don't bite. <laughs> we, we are glad to help. So thank you all for participating and uh, it's been my pleasure to host this session and uh, enjoy the insights from our three young colleagues. So with that, I Tiffany, I would hand over to you if you want to make any closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you, Dr. Kolodrubets, Dr. Gu, and Dr. Yunyungo for sharing your time, knowledge, and experience with the attendees. For additional information and a comprehensive list of Office of Research events, please visit research.utdallas.edu. Thank you.